Welcome. We are so glad you are opting in this afternoon to the Afghan Summit. We're very pleased to be able to have this opportunity for Luminous Network for New Americans with the Afghan Alliance of Maryland to co-sponsor with the United Nations Association, the National Capital Area. I'm Jill Christensen. I actually have a foot in both organizations. With Luminous, my role is volunteer coordinator and outreach. With the United Nations Association of the National Capital, I'm chairman of, and chair of the board. Thanks for making time this afternoon. It's been powerful to see how many people from across Maryland and truly our nation have wanted to do the right thing and express great goodwill in helping, in fact, Afghan refugees settle in our communities. Today, we're going to focus on that and really look at how we can do that. Some of you are already involved. Some of you want to be involved. Following today, we're going to follow, show you steps in order to get that done. So with that, thank you for making time and the commitment this afternoon in order to do that. We're going to start by hearing from Mike Mitchell, who is the CEO of Luminous. And as things started unfolding in August, Mike started thinking immediately about what that would mean for our state and across the country. Mike has extensive experience with resettlement agencies, with nonprofit management and providing supports long-term at times for in fact immigrants so that they truly can be fully engaged as new Americans. Mike, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jill, and thank you everyone for joining today. I am really grateful that all of you have taken time on a Sunday afternoon to be with us. Um, one of the things this comes so close to my heart because I was actually raised in Afghanistan. So I work for an organization that serves people from around the world and we serve immigrants from all backgrounds and all walks of life. Luminous was founded about four, uh, 40 years ago um, to make a difference. And in this case, we're looking forward to making a difference. Um, if we could highlight the slide that shows the summit goals, that would be great, which is the second slide. Um, so in the next uh, two hours, we are going to have three goals for all of you. The first goal is to understand our model. Um, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the idea is that Luminous does not see itself as the sole provider or the sole instigator of services for people. But what we want to do is figure out a way that we can provide the services that we provide, but also the rolling offer and people who are doing the good work. The second thing that we are aiming to do today is to actually have a speaker who's going to talk about cultural competence to help us, many, many of the native born Americans, to understand how to manage their volunteering. And thirdly, to have clarity and confidence about how you can volunteer through the Afghan Alliance of Maryland. So we'll get into that in a second, but if you could put on the next slide, what I wanna say is that we understand that we don't know everything. It's not just the volunteers, but it's actually the idea of having an advisory board. We know that we will learn best and provide our best service possible if we are informed by people who are Afghan Americans and Muslim Americans who can offer the best feedback to all of us so those people highlighted that we thank very much who have offered to do that, um, many of whom will be on the call today, are gonna be with us. Now with that, I will turn it over to our uh, co-host of the summit. Uh, we're really grateful to have them as a partner uh, and that's the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area and Paola Ballin. Paola. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area, I want to thank Luminous, its leadership and staff for the opportunity to partner on such a timely gathering, which aims at developing a network of networks for Afghan families relocating in Maryland, so we can understand the needs at stake and help connect networks of volunteers who want to be of service. So thank you all for your interest in joining today's summit. UNANCA is one of the largest and most active chapters of the UN Association of the USA. 
with over 200 community and student chapters campus across the country, constituting the largest movement of Americans advocating for a strong partnership between the United Nations and the United States. Serving over 1,200 members in the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Northern Virginia, UNANCA strives to increase public understanding and support of the United Nations, encourage constructive US leadership in strengthening the UN, and preparing present and future leaders to work for a better world, both globally and locally. The UNANCA works through its program committees focusing on human rights, sustainable development, international law, peace and security, a vibrant model UN program engaging middle and high school students, active young professionals, and a graduate fellows program. It is an intergenerational membership organization with many ways to get involved. So if you are not a member yet, consider joining our movement and help us make a different difference at the global and local levels. It is now my pleasure to introduce UNANCA Advisory Council member, Sarah Craven, a policy advocate and attorney with experience in global health and human rights, who currently serves as the chief director of the Washington office of UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund. In this role, Sarah advocates for UNFPA's mandate, which envisions a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and every young person can live to their full potential. Sarah has worked on advocacy campaigns focused on empowering women and girls and ending harmful traditional practices, including child marriage and female genital mutilation. Prior to her work at UNFPA, she held positions at the US Department of State and also serving uh, with two senators. Sarah has served as policy advisor to CD, CEDPA, CEDPA, during the 1994 International Conference on Population and the 1995 Fourth World Conference on, on Women in Beijing, China. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm, I'm muting myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Paula and uh, the UN Association of the National Capital Area and Luminous for inviting me here today to speak to all of you. Um, I feel very humble to be joining you all today. I feel somewhat unworthy because I know there are so many people here on this call today with knowledge and expertise about Afghanistan. But in the brief time, I'm going to share with you some kind of broad stroke overviews of what um, our new neighbors are coming from, particularly women and girls, and then talk a little bit from a personal note on how important I think today is. Um, as we move into 2022, more than half of the Afghan population are in need of humanitarian aid, and more, more than 11 million of this population, and I'm saying those who are still in Afghanistan are women and girls. When the Taliban de facto authorities came into power in August, development assistance halted abruptly and foreign assets were frozen. This and Afghanistan, sent Afghanistan's economy into freefall and has pushed the health system into the very brink of collapse. And the dire situation has been compounded by the impacts of drought and COVID-19, which have created a perfect storm for one of the most profound humanitarian crises the world has ever seen and it is Afghan women and girls who are paying the heaviest price. In the last 20 years, women and girls have had fought for their rights in Afghanistan with uneven but important successes. Expanded access to healthcare has had important gains, including significant declines in one of the highest maternal mortality rates. One Afghan woman dies in for pregnancy-related complications every two hours. There have been increases in the provision of prenatal and antenatal care, the use of modern contraception, and the number of attended births. And legislation to protect women and girls from violence, more than half of all women, Afghan women experience violence during their lifetime, lifetime has been enacted. 
and su support services for survivors of violence have been established, including legal aid to facilitate access to justice, although these have fallen short of what was envisioned for women and girls. But unfortunately today, women, Afghan women and girls hope for the future have dwindled. They have reduced access to education and employment opportunities and essential services, and access to basic and essential healthcare services, particularly for women and girls living in remote parts of the country is now severely diminished, if not completely unavailable. Now, many of you may not be familiar with my UN agency, UNFPA. We're one of the specialized humanitarian agencies that work within the UN system in partnership with organizations such as UNICEF, UNHCR, UN Development Program. And we have been working in Afghanistan for over 45 years. And during that time, our mission has remained the same, to ensure that all women and girls can live in freedom, equality, and peace, and actively participate in all aspects of society. We at UNFPA, as well as all of our UN brothers and sister organizations, remain operational during ensuring that women and girls can access essential life-saving maternal health and protective services. And we uh, follow the call of uh, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said that the UN was going to stay and deliver. So we at UNFPA continue to deliver uh, um, services at 170 family health houses, which provide maternal health services in remote areas of the country to ensure that women can deliver safely. And I have a long list of the kind of work that we continue to do. But I have to say, um, when I was preparing these remarks, my colleagues in Afghanistan were sharing with me remarkable stories, remarkable stories of Afghan women who have been delivering under very dire circumstances and who have been fortunate, the fortunate ones who've been able to get to some of the services that UNFPA um, provides. And one of the stories that was shared was about a midwife who was delivering a woman who suddenly they discovered that she was giving twin birth to twins. And it's rare that a midwife will deliver twins. She had to call, uh, we have a support line. She called, she was able to be talked through how to bring the two babies in. And then the new mother went into severe um, hemorrhaging. And again, being able to call the hospital and being given guidance to save the mother's life, the mother and her two daughters are now doing fine. But these are the kind of stories that are happening every day in, most, in the most dire circumstances. And I reflect that when I read the Washington Post last week, like many of you did, about some of the new Afghan um, neighbors who have come here to our country and in Baltimore, we're also in the same situation, delivering a baby without having access to the kind of services. So the kinds of issues that I'm, I'm describing to you, and I know we're going to talk about later today, are the same issues that these women and girls and their families have experienced in Afghanistan, and they're now here in the United States looking for access to services, looking for hopeful, hope and education. Um, I have um, really had the opportunity to meet some of these new, um, new uh, welcome Afghan refugees to our community. And I can see that they are very traumatized and nervous and scared, but at the same time filled with such hope. And I think the hope is because of all of us who are on this call today, the welcoming and the support that we can provide them so in my brief time with you, I just want to end on a very personal note, taking off my professional hat. I have been very lucky, I know they're on this call today, to um, meet Reverend Ann Durst and her team at St. John's Norwood Episcopal Church and their programming, Nour Nourishing Bethesda. And my, my group of fellow moms here in Bethesda, we've been delivering bread every Friday, Afghan bread. And we've learned each week along the way um, what we've learned first, we brought the bread. The next week we brought bread and feta. Now we've learned that the bread we bring, what we thought was going to last a week is only lasting a day. So we're learning along the way, but it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to take this global work and bring it to the local level. So again, I'm so grateful to be here today and I'm um, excited to hear what we're going to talk about. And thank you to Luminous and UNA NCA for bringing us together. And I'm now turning it over to Shakira. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shakira Rahimi, uh, the Afghan Alliance Coordinator at Luminous Network. Uh, now I would like to uh, introduce to you Frishta Tayeb, uh, who has interpretation translation company who is a facilitator and host of video series, 
and daughter of Afghan immigrant to deliver her talks about culture, cultural competencies. Farishta Tayyab. Thank you so much, uh, Shakira John. That was a very kind introduction. Thank you so much. Um, it is my honor to be here uh, and to be collaborating with Luminous and UNANCA, UNFPA. Um, you guys do very, very important work and I appreciate you giving me the time to talk about um, the importance of cultural competence and the importance of um, understanding the uh, population that you serve, right? So the first thing um, that I usually do, um, I've had the honor of being kind of on the front lines since August um, and really getting um, a feel and a pulse of what's happening uh, with this entire multi-layered uh, crisis in Afghanistan. I've been dealing with the evacuees. Um, I have been dealing with uh, those folks that are on um, the basis. Most of them have closed now. There's only one open at this point in which I am there full time. And really understanding some of the challenges that folks are going through once they're being resettled. The first thing that I always talk about when I do these presentations is why do I do this, right? And Shakira John said that I am the daughter of an Afghan refugee, although I was born and raised here. My mother sought political asylum right after the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. Um, and I grew up in a household in which I actually watched both of my immigrant parents go through these struggles and not necessarily have um, a support system, a resettlement agency, guidance as to how to survive and how to make it in the United States. So this is a very personal cause for me. And um, I really strongly believe that cultural competency is the key to bridging the gap between both providers and the population that they are serving, right? We all need to be understood. We all want to be seen. We all want to be heard, right? And a big issue that we've been having throughout this process since August is it's, it's quite bifold, right? We have, on one hand, we have the lack of cultural competency um, of Afghanistan, of understanding the culture and the people, but then we also have the lack of cultural orientation that these folks have come from these safe havens and spent a very long time there and haven't really fully understood the way or any type of guidance or orientation as to how this country works. So very important that as you all serve this population, you remember that there's going to be some major gaps, right? Some major things that you wanna be aware of. Um, just very briefly, because I know the cultural or uh, competency usually takes um, some time to go through, but I'll do like a really quick crash course. Afghanistan is um, pretty much the size approximately of Texas. So you can imagine these folks have come to the United States and the country is the size of one state and we've got 50 states in this country. And it's an enormous and overwhelming feeling to come from such a small place and come to such a vast area, right? This is a challenge. This is a scary thought. Uh, people are intimidated by the fact that they're being resettled in certain states and may not be familiar with the area, the climate, what it means to live in this region without support systems. So organizations such as yours are so important. Important. The resettlement agencies are having some challenges when it comes to being understaffed. They're having some challenges too when it comes to kind of connecting some of these dots, lack of housing. So these organizations that are on this call today are so incredibly important to supplement in those gaps, right? To bridge those gaps that these overall overworked folks may not be able to necessarily bridge, right? It's also important to understand that since Afghanistan is in Central Asia, it's in the heart of Asia, it is landlocked and surrounded by major countries, right? We've got China, we've got Russia, we've got Iran. The influences of these countries are very prevalent in this region, right? And it's a major faux pas. You don't ask an Afghan 
what ethnicity do you belong to, right? Which um, which of these uh, that are listed here do you belong to? Which of these do you feel the most relatable to, right? It's better to ask like, what language do you speak? What language do you prefer? Um, and, and that would make it politically correct. So the four major ethnic groups in Afghanistan, if you look at the brown and the key are Pashtuns, in the green, you'll find the Tajiks. In the yellow, you'll feel, feel, uh, find the Hazaras, and followed by the Uzbeks. The smaller minorities are the Turkmen, the Nuristani, the Baluch, and the Pasha'i. We're having a lot of problems um, throughout the diaspora finding interpreters for um, Baluch, for Nuristani, and for Pasha'i, because they're such a small and rare population that the dialects of their language we're finding is harder to, to um, locate people who speak those languages. Um, here's another one. Uh, people that are from Afghanistan are Afghans. We are not Afghanis. Afghanis. Afghani is our currency. This gentleman on the screen, his name is Kais Esar. He is a pop star. He plays that instrument that you see, the rabab. And he felt so passionate about this element of cultural competence um, that he named his album, I'm Afghan, Afghani's Currency. I hear it a lot at the safe havens. I hear it a lot amongst people that um, folks are called Afghanis, right? And, and certainly I'm sure nobody in this room would want to be addressed um, as currency. So important to keep that in mind when dealing with Afghans. Freshly, if I could just interrupt and just ask you to put the sure. uh, slideshow on full screen so folks ah. can see. A couple of people have re requested that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yes, absolutely. Is this better? Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Great. No problem. So the major religions, um, the major religion, I should say, in Afghanistan is Islam. And um, there's two sects, Shia or Sunni. Uh, I went to Catholic school, so I equate it to Catholicism and Protestantism. Um, kind of looking at uh, from that lens, that's the best way we can explain it without getting into detail. We have a 2% population that consists of Jews, Hindus, and Sikhs. Um, very important to know and understand. And the languages that are spoken in Afghanistan are Pashto and Dari. Um, Dari may also at times an Afghan might tell you, I speak Farsi. Um, we're trying to get Afghans um, into the habit of saying Dari, because Farsi is the language that's speaking in, spoken in Iran. So what ends up happening is when you're looking for an interpreter, the person, if you say, I speak Farsi, they're going to bring an Iranian interpreter, right? And the major difference between uh, Dari that's spoken in Afghanistan as opposed to Farsi that's spoken in Iran is that that dialect is um, like American English to British English, right? So that is pretty much um, the best way that I can explain that. And some words and idioms and expressions are different. So it's important to say, for, for the person to say that they speak daddy, it's very helpful. I'm not gonna go get into too many uh, specific statistics of the country, but I do wanna talk a little bit about PTSD. Um, war obviously can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you really want, to think about this when you deal with the Afghan population. People who come from war-torn regions, really uh, PTSD is a normal reaction to something very abnormal to hap that has happened to an individual. So with that is gonna come feelings of mistrust, paranoia may develop, and it's gonna be important for you to build a rapport with these folks, right? You're most likely when you're dealing with this population, you're not going to get a lot of information and a lot of answers in the first conversation you have with them, right? You want to ease into it. You want to start your conversation with a nice warm cup of tea, right? You want to start off making that person feel like you understand their culture. You know them. You understand that this is what Afghans drink. They like green tea and this is part of the culture, right? Um, Understanding cultural nuances in Afghan culture, gender, you know, gender relations. I really, um, you know, unfortunately don't have a lot of time to get into all of this, but I will say simple rule of thumb, when you're addressing somebody from the opposite gender, you always want to take your right hand across your chest, slightly bow and say salam or peace. Um, I think that it starts that conversation with this feeling of um, comfort this feeling that these people understand my culture, it's also very respectful. The Asian 
Um, a culture is a very um, disciplined culture. Uh, you know, sometimes you see Japanese people, they also bow. We do the hand bow. Um, it shows that you have respect for the person. Um, you know, I would not extend, if I'm a male, I would not extend my hand out to a female. And I would address the, the head of household, which is the male. It's a patriarchal society. I would, I would ask the husband for permission to speak to the wife if I'm a male. Um, just, just to, um, because the father, I want you to think, right? This is a war. A lot of trauma has happened. A lot of displacement has happened. These folks really want to really um, feel like they want to protect their family, right? So if a gentleman is standing in front of his family, it's because he wants to protect them. It's that he wants his entire um, family to really uh, be seen and understand and heard, right? So I'm going to actually come out of the, um, the crash course here, which was probably the fastest one that I've ever done. Apologies that I had to rush through it a little bit, um, but I'm sure we'll meet another time to talk a little bit more in depth about it. Some stories that I wanted to share with you, some challenges when it comes to the Afghan people, when it comes to resettlement, and when it comes to trauma. It's really important to understand that when people have experienced displacement and when people have experienced different types of trauma, this will come out in different ways, right? This will come out in different ways. And it's very important to start this relationship in a very very um, general, respectful manner, and let that rapport grow between each other, right? Um, one of the challenges that I faced being in the safe havens and on the base is domestic violence. You guys are going to probably encounter a lot of DV cases um, because of the cultural differences. Important to understand that um, it's not to say that Afghanistan ex accepts domestic violence. It's That's not the correct thing to say, but when it comes to um, prosecution, when it comes to family, remember this is a collective society and we live in an individualistic society. This is a monochronic society. Afghanistan is a polychronic society. Our concepts of time, our concepts of family, all of these things differ. So back home, you would have families gathering and discussing with elders these types of issues and sometimes familial issues are not even encouraged to be discussed in front of people, right? So there is not necessarily this um, restraining orders or, you know, so it's important for people to learn first, right? I always say, teach people first, right? Teach them how to fish, tell them, look, in this country, these are the rules for the cultural orientation. This is accepted and this is not accepted. You will definitely find a lot of that. Also disciplining children, there is a different system of discipline in most countries, right? So really, really important to have that understanding um, when it comes to this particular population. Um, before I leave and before I end um, my segment of this, I really would like to share some, just one story um, of, of an individual who um, I had encountered in the beginning. Uh, thank you, Jill, I appreciate that. Um, so I have a few minutes to talk about my story. So um, I had this particular family and they were really giving me a lot of um, pushback. They had a really, really difficult time. Um, this family had been separated. We helped to reunite them. Um, the wife was uh, in one base. The husband was another base. And so there was a big strain. The husband was actually with the children. The woman got separated after reunifying them, after speaking with them, after counseling with them, the husband was able to get off the base, get a job, and, um, and now they're doing a lot better, right? But don't get discouraged. There's going to be a lot of um, families and a lot of situations that aren't going to pan out like that, right? You're going to have some real serious issues that you're going to be dealing with. Remember that when people don't speak a language, right? There's, there's a literacy issue. There's a lack of language issue. Sometimes what ends up happening is they may want to relay their issues and their problems to resettlement agencies or to caseworkers, and they're not able to advocate for themselves. So I would say that one of the most important jobs that we have as individuals, each and every one of you on this call, is to serve as advocates, as to serve as people to give these folks a voice the voice that they most likely don't know how to use yet, right? 
Um, they don't know their rights. They don't know their responsibilities. And the refugee curve can be anywhere between one to three years. So it's going to take some time until they get there. Hold their hand. And believe me, when you hold their hand, you're really holding their heart. And um, with that, I will uh, conclude. And um, I wish you all the best. And I thank you for putting forward any all the efforts that you have. I'll be sharing a link to a cultural linguistically appropriate handbook so that all of you can have a copy of that and use it as service providers. I'll also leave my email if you'd like to, if you have any other questions, um, I would be very happy to get in contact with you and to try to assist you as best as I can. Thank you. Krista Tabe, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I saw Freshta on a YouTube video that she had done actually an event for Lutheran Social Services and was so impressed. This was actually recorded last February. And we began talking within Luminous and the Afghan Alliance of Maryland, who really could help us set the right track. Obviously we gave you an incredible challenge of 15 minutes of how do you do cultural competency, but it was an important, and thank you, Tashakur, opening of in fact what we need to know of hearts and hands and how we work together with cultural competence with understanding the variations of we may be working with people from very different ethnic groups who may not even have pashto or dari as their first language coming from different faiths as well as then the variables of family relations intimate partner violence all of those pieces that may be experienced. So yeah, we are ready. We are gearing up as advocates and absolutely with our new Afghan neighbors. So Fresta, again, thank you so much for your presentation with us. Well, I've been quite excited because I've been watching the numbers on this event for the Afghan summit. We have 272 people with us right now and we have three polling questions. We want to know who's here. So let's have our first question. Are you attending today as an individual or with a group or organization? Go ahead and just move your cursor to that circle, hit submit, and we're going to start getting some answers. We'll give you a moment to do this. You know, we've had many different organizations, both mosques, churches, synagogues, rotary organizations, all kinds of associations, including, for example, literacy organizations, emergency management folks that have stepped up and wanted to be involved with today and wanted to help. So in just a second, as long as you have done your voting, we're gonna see the results of this. Okay. Here we are, 56% of us are a part of a group or an organization signing on today, and 44% have responded to the individual call. Thank you very much. And now, in fact, second question. Where are you from? Where are you currently based? So you see, we have a whole handful plus of Maryland counties plus elsewhere in the state, Virginia, Washington, DC, and elsewhere. And I will tell you that at least one of our elsewheres is outside of the United States, supporters that we have from around the globe. So go ahead and take a moment to respond to that one and we will get results. So in just a second, we will get everybody voting in. Spokane, Washington, welcome to our room. You know, we thought as we started planning this of how important it would be to provide just a bit on cultural constructs. So we were so glad to have Sarah, and Sarah Craven from the United Nations Family Planning Organization Population Fund, UNFPA, with us. 
and then fresh to tape. It really set us off very well. So results, are they coming in? Okay. Ah, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County, a lot of Maryland's, 4% of folks from Virginia, 3% from DC. Thank you so much. This helps us as far as, again, how we're framing things today and knowing as we move ahead with the Afghan Alliance of Maryland. And the third question, please. What is your current involvement with the Afghan newcomers? Not involved yet, helping Afghans in hotels temporarily, helping Afghans in permanent housing, or I've been helping in another way. Take a moment, go ahead and vote. In a little while here in our second hour, um, we'll get an opportunity to participate in breakout sessions too, because we know a lot of people here have experience. A lot of people here have reached out to different resettlement agencies wanting to get involved. Some of you have been. And again, it was good to have Sarah Craven talk about her support that she's been providing in Montgomery County, again, with a team of people. So this is great. And I appreciate that people are actively using the chat because this provides us with some record too of what's going on and how important this is. So our results will be with us in just a moment. And here we go. 53% of us are not involved yet. There's potential, there's opportunity, 11% are working in helping folks at the hotels. 14% already are helping Afghans in permanent housing and 23% helping in another way. And sometimes that can be, for example, um, an Islamic school in Baltimore County, Maryland, that's putting together welcome packs for students and helping to do that, which means they're not actually doing direct interface yet with in fact, Afghans families that are coming in but providing behind the scenes background support. And I know many of you have helped in that way too. So with that, you may be wondering, okay, Afghan Alliance of Maryland, how does this really, really work? I'm gonna pass it back to then Mike Mitchell, the CEO of Luminous, that again is the sponsor of the Afghan Alliance of Maryland. Mike, please go ahead. Thanks Jill and, and thanks everybody. Um, it, it's uh, really impressive to see all those uh, questions be answered. Um, so what is Luminous doing and, and what is this all about? So um, as somebody who has a background in working what are, with what are called resettlement agencies, um, I worked for HIAS and LIRS, and I've also worked on the ground for community-based organizations um, locally and nationally. And when we started seeing what was happening in August, we thought about how could we approach the situation different? How could we make sure that the different segments of approaches from different organizations could become brought together in a way that was healthy and in a way that would link the social capital of our respective organizations? So number one, we decided the best way we could do this is by being a platform. Luminous offers a certain number of services directly, for example, legal services, social services, um, what resettlement local affiliates offer. And then we could also think, well, maybe there's a way that we could link organizations that are individuals and small organizations together. And that's to be a platform, and I'll show you how in a second. Number two, Luminous can't and no organization on this call can provide all the services necessary. And the challenge that we see as we approach the Afghan situation is how do we break out of our silos? How can we become a network of networks so that if a volunteer that's working with a synagogue that might be working with Lutheran social services could actually help somebody being sponsored in Annapolis um, on the other side of the region? How could we do this in a way that would be effective for everyone involved so that volunteers were not pigeonholed to specific areas only? 
And so we came up with this way of approach of approaching it. The third thing I'd say is that Luminous is approaching this with complete humility. We are but one small organization out of many. And we know that the way to do this is to be in partnership. And we've already started doing that. So if you could pull up the, uh, the slide number six for me, please. I will share exactly how that looks. So number one, what are called resettlement agencies, such as Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and IRC and HIAS, they typically provide stability and 90-day uh, services. Now they also provide services after that, but the folks who arrive need support for years after, and it's important that that support continues. And that's where you come in as a community. So how can Luminous fill in on the self-sufficiency? It is not to say that those other organizations, the resettlement agencies are not providing those things. They certainly are. But as they get pressure to move on to case after case after case, it's up to us as community-based organizations, individuals, churches, and synagogues to actually do something to make sure that support continues. And that's not glamorous work, it's tough. So in the next slide, we'll share kind of our approach from a visual perspective. So the Afghan Alliance of Maryland is simply a network. And if you look at the far left of the screen, you'll see that we are getting referrals from non-resettlement agencies. For example, a church might be approaching us saying, we've got these three or four things covered, but we actually need help with these two. A resettlement agency, like we have a good partnership with Lutheran Social Services of the National Capital Area that are actually referring cases to us, or we might be getting referrals from hotels. We have a partnership with Anne Arundel County right now, and we actually have an Afghan Welcome Center there where we're supporting arrivals. Those three entities fill out an intake form. And then on the right of your screen, you can see volunteer teams. And a volunteer team for the Afghan Alliance of Maryland could be a group of neighbors, it could be a church, it could be a mosque, it could be a civic group like Rotary. It could be self-defined as any group that you all would like to form. And that group basically logs on and says that they wanna do volunteer placement and they fill out a form. And then what Luminous is doing is it's putting this together in three different categories. In the first category are direct services that are often tied to government or um, some services that are required by what's called the RMP agreement. In some cases, we as volunteers in the community can provide that, um, but in other cases, it might just be done by the resettlement agency and the affiliate of the resettlement agency. Number two, we desperately need volunteers to do things like ESL and provide transportation and tutoring. This isn't work that's gonna stop at 90 days or even 180 days. It's work that's gonna continue for a year, maybe even two years. And then lastly, there's the category of material support, which many of you have already talked about in the chat that you're already providing. We know that housing is the biggest crisis right now, um, and that's getting out. Um, and we are working with partners to try and support that. So those three categories come together. And when you fill out a form, it looks like this when you see the next sheet. If you can uh, switch the slide. So basically volunteers um, will fill out forms and they'll complete one of these different categories that they are open to serving in. Um, and there are about eight categories here. And what happens for the clients, the referral sources, is that they too will fill out who's referring to us and they'll also say what it is that they need. And what Luminous is going to do is, if you can show the, the next slide, please. is breaking these categories and really matching them together. So you can go ahead and um, uh, uh, stop the slide presentation. So what's happening is that Luminous is actually acting as a platform. So about once a week or once every two weeks, what we're doing is we're actually matching the volunteer offers with the volunteer with the needs, the Afghan needs. And Chakra Rahimi is gonna be playing a role in creating connections. Now, some of this is gonna entail training. It'll be training directly by us or it'll be training by partner organizations. And that training is gonna be things like, how do you help a client get a driver's license? 
How do you help somebody with SNAP benefits? How do you help somebody with the different things that they need to sign up for? And when those trainings are done, you may be asked to help someone in another network in another part of the region. And so by creating those connections, we are trying to lessen the amount of friction that exists when organizations jump forward and say, we want to do something, we want to help. And that's the unique approach that we're trying to take in this. Now, we know that this approach is going to take time to uh, really strengthen and be uh, perfect. So in the short term, it, there might be some bumps, but it's already working. The good news is that we've been seeing clients um, and we probably already have at least 50 clients that need services. And some of those will provide directly and some we won't. So with that, I will go ahead and um, pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Mike. You know, I really appreciate that you've reinforced what Fresh just said as far as this is a long-term process. Yes, resettlement agencies may have 90 days to complete what's necessary with, in fact, expectations of the U.S. government in resettling refugees, but we know it takes a long time. Family livelihood, economic stability, ensuring that kids start in school, English acquisition, all of those variables fit very closely together. With that, certainly we're in this for short-term supports long-term supports. So very, very important. And with that, I'm gonna pass this over now to Shakra Rahimi, who will share some of her story that led her to being the coordinator of the Afghan Alliance of Maryland with Luminous, and then how we are approaching what we know so far of the situation across the state. Please, Shakra. Uh, thank you, Jed. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, a little bit about my story and about Afghan refugees settled in Maryland. Uh, as I introduce myself, my name is Shakra Rahimi, an Afghan physician currently serving the Luminous Network for New Americans as the Afghan Alliance Coordinator. I grew up in Afghanistan as a child and young adult, I was eager to help others. Although it was difficult, I was able to pursue an education in the medical field and become a physician in 1999. Uh, my field of concentration was maternal and child health. Uh, from 2002 to 2014, I worked closely with the US government and US aid organizations on maternal and child health initiatives at uh, various teaching hospitals in Kabul, Afghanistan. In 2014, the U.S. granted me a special immigration visa to bring my family to safety in the United States. I have three children, two in college and one in high school. Our family was welcomed to the U.S. by World Relief, one of the nine national resettlement agency. Since I had a strong desire to help refugees, I soon was working as a case aide, assisting to resettle other newly arrived refugees. I learned many things through my own experience, having to flee my country and many more things as I tried to assist other refugees. Here are just a few. When you are forced to flee your country for the safety of your family, it's extremely difficult to leave behind extended family and good friends, your culture, cherished belonging, and favorite places and hold, that hold precious memories. It's challenging to start life all over again in a new country, where the language, culture, and expectation are so different. And where your previous education experience and qualifications may not be recognized, especially if you are still dealing with the trauma of violence, threats, sudden separation, and great loss. Can you imagine if tomorrow you suddenly learn that you and your family would be in grave danger if you remained in the US and you had to leave 
quickly with no time to prepare and only whatever you couldn't put in your backpack. Never to see your home or extended family or friends again. Can you imagine that when you arrived in the country that allowed you to come, no employer recognized your credential. So you had to start again at the bottom of the job ladder. Had to learn not just a new language, but also an entirely different system. These are typical experience of a refugee. But for a refugee, the safety and security of their family is of primary importance. Until recently, I was working as a surgeon assistant at various teaching hospitals in Maryland. But when more than 70,000 Afghans were airlifted to the US last summer, I realized that my firsthand understanding of the refugee experience and also the experience that I had with resettlement agencies at Earth Relief, it's, it is the unique assistance to help the newcomers. I am passionate about working for and with refugees. And I am happy to be working with Afghan Alliance through Luminous. Now I would like to tell you about the many Afghan families who have arrived in our region of Maryland. Over the past three weeks, I have met more than 60 Afghan families who have been sent from the military bases to a resettle agency in Maryland. However, there are a number of challenges. The major challenge is finding safe housing near public transportation and jobs, affordable and sustainable on an entry level wage. There is currently a very low housing vacancy rate in Maryland. For this reason, the resettlement agencies are temporarily housing the Afghan families in extended stay hotels in Lenticum, Jessup, Columbia, Landover, Gatorsburg, Bethesda, Germantown, and more. Have you ever been on vacation with small children and had a day when you were trapped in the hotel due to a bad weather? Can you imagine then the experience of Afghan families who are now isolated in a single hotel room with many small children, not for a day, but for months, with nothing productive they can do and only a rare chance to talk with an overwhelmed caseworker? and no clear answer about their future. These families don't want to waste even one minute in the US, a land of opportunities, but they have been in the hotels for several months now with no access to schools for their children or educational activities for adults who are eager to learn. But it's encouraging that so many of you are interested in helping these families. Please consider what you might be able to do to address these needs that, are, that I have heard from most of these families during my conversation with almost most of them. What are these needs? More permanent safe housing, employment opportunities and transportation, English classes, and other educational opportunities, both for the children and adults. Reliable assistance with obtaining permanent immigration status. While all Afghans are legally present in the US, the majority have been admitted in a temporary status known as a humanitarian parole, which only allows them to stay in the US for two years. And we all know of which six months of those two years have already passed. They have been told that they need to find attorneys and apply for asylum in the US, which they need extra hand and assistance. Thank you for your attention and your compassion. It is my hope that each one of you will find at least one way that you can help 
one or more of your new Afghan neighbors. Thank you again. Chakra, Chakra Tashkur. That is so wonderful to be able to hear some of your personal journey that in fact is a huge motivator in the work that you're doing as Afghan coordinator of the Afghan Alliance. Thank you very, very much. With that too, I think we're reminded about the power of the personal story in in fact, guiding our directions. There is great hope. The great hope is that we have 270 people on here right now, 270 with networks that have been shared in all the chat. I wonder if we can add in the slide then, uh, which is slide nine. One more time, please. We are now at the point of, in fact, doing breakout groups. And in just a moment, you're going to have the opportunity to decide what breakout group, what discussion you would like to be in. Let me share a couple things before we start moving. One, these are short, just 18 minutes. It's going to go very fast. There is a facilitator who will lead the conversation and truly elicit from the group resources that you have. It's been exciting to see what you've put in the chat. I will mention every breakout group needs to have one reporter and to record everything, you know, written record of, of what is shared. Um, I will remember to mention to you as well that the chat function when recording Zooms once you go into the breakout room, the chat is not recorded. So if you have something important to share, bring it back to the main session later. So with that, take a moment. We'll go ahead and start as far as our, our tech team and, and getting this going to go ahead and decide whether you want to be in housing, to discuss health, supporting doctor's appointments, vaccinations, government connections and navigation, SNAP, food stamp, Medicaid, down the road driver's licenses, education focusing on student enrollment and tutoring, transportation, career and skills, English or legal services. So with that, um, please go ahead and um, go ahead and join a breakout room. You see at the bottom of your screen, most likely, um, you see the link that's called breakout rooms. Go ahead and raise your notes. And basically we will then get you in the room. We'll give you a notice on your screen when it's time to go back to the main room. You've got lots of choices. Go ahead and join one of those. Hey, Jill, um, this is Paul yes, Lemley. Please, Paul. I just put a Google doc into the chat I know it's late. I just thought about it, but if a facilitator wants to take that, they can make their own copy and put it in the chat of their group. So you can use that as a notes taking template. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. All right, Diane Dunn doesn't see the breakout links. Uh, look at your, your screen, um, probably at the bottom, Diane, where you've got participants chat, share screen, record, breakout rooms. That's what you go to, hit breakout rooms, and you will see options for all kinds of groups. And you can also see then how many people are, are in each room. For those that choose to, if you cannot see the breakout room and you wanna stay in this room, that is possible. And we'll have a discussion here. But how do you sign on? I, I just, I'm missing that part. I see the different groups. Um, Andrew, oh, okay, like, thank you for the question. Andrew, please. Like I say, English, I, I, I would like to work with, with, um, with the adults in English and I see names already on there. How do I add my name? Hi, thank you for your question. Uh, there should be a join button next to that group. If you hover over it, you'll see it uh, looks like a blue button that says join in white over it. You have to go um, to the bottom of the screen, the bottom of the breakup rooms. Okay. That's where the join is. All right. I'm sorry, I can't see any of the groups. Okay, let's see. Um, either can I, I still can't see anything. I cannot see, the, see it either. Okay, so we have 28 people right here who are talking with each other. And if you wanted to stay in this 
space for a general discussion, we can do that. Um, otherwise, perhaps, um, yeah, if you put a note in the chat, maybe in fact, Andrew, can you help move people into rooms? Certainly. Thank oh, you so much. Give me a moment. Okay. Yes, I don't, can I, can I, I be moved going. to English? Please me put the note in the chat if you would like to move into a specific room. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. I think I am left behind. <laughs> Where should I go? <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> My choice, how? How could I go there? The choices include legal, education, government services, transportation, health. Basically, I am doing all of them <laughs> so far. Well, pick, once a, pick one for now. Okay. Thank you. I already picked all of them. Mm. Hey, Dale, um, this is Sarah. I'm trying to join the employment services. Yes. And I cannot see the subgroup. I don't know why. All right. Um, again, I cannot place people into groups. It is our colleague, Andrew Dole, who's doing that. And he's doing it by the chat. If you can put a note in the chat of where you would like to go. Thank, thank you, Jill. I'm trying to get people to rooms as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the list of unassigned people is not alphabetized. So I'm kind of sort of digging through that as quickly as humanly possible. Aye, that's hard. Okay. And again, we can start um, discussing these questions right now, if you like, for anyone that would like to stay right here. So let me go ahead and begin that. Um, and so the first question is, in fact, are you involved already? And how are you involved in supporting the Afghan Afghan newcomers. Is there anyone that would like to share what you're doing? Excuse me. Can I say something? Please go right ahead. Sure. Um, actually, I have so many calls from Afghanians, people who need help. Mm, the reason I asked them why you are just calling me, they said because no one else is answering our phone. Our case worker is not answering our phone. And uh, we are left behind. We are hungry. We don't have warm clothes. We don't have, like today, I had a telephone call. Someone called me. She told me, don't tell anyone. I don't, uh, I don't want people to know about this. I told her, don't worry. What is it? So she had a problem that she couldn't tell anyone. So I had to get the medication she needed and I gave it to her. It was a medication, it was such a shampoo. So uh, I am over the phone till late at night time and early in the morning, even I was in the bed, still in the bed, telephone call, even I was on the Zoom right now, I had a telephone call from one of them. So yeah. they need help. We need someone to answer their phone. We need to someone who knows how to speak Farsi to talk to them and see what is their need and make a list of that. So Absolutely. in your list, I didn't see that, that <laughs> answer in their phone. Uh, well, so sure. yeah, they have so many, 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 many needs that we are barely could catch up with it. And every day I am working with Mastut, they send me new people, new family, and they find me from the mouth <laughs> word from each other because they have very good connection to each other. So they call me every day, at least three people, three Afghanis new family, they arrive. So they really need someone they could answer their phone. I don't mind to answer their phone, but because I am working full-time Monday through Friday, um, I don't want to interrupt my work, but they need my help. I am stuck there, so I want someone to answer their phone Monday through Friday. Someone who knows Farsi. Yes. 
So thank you, because clearly what you're speaking about is being totally overloaded. And if you can only imagine then those newcomers and how they're feeling and in fact, not having every, all of their needs met. With that, that's why we're doing today to truly raise volunteers and build volunteer support. Um, we are trying to work effectively with the resettlement agencies. We know they're overloaded. overloaded. We know too that in fact, um, you know, in some ways this is a perfect storm because of in fact the rise in the cost of living and particularly then as far as rents and what that's meaning. But also mm -hmm. think about in 2020, the United States officially took in only 11,500 refugees. And wow. all in the course of a couple months, here we have 70 to 80,000 who are here just from Afghanistan. Okay. So I'd love to hear from others if in fact you were involved or ways that you would like to be involved. Are there uh, others on the call that would like to share? Yes, my name is Hannah Coyle-Pole and I'm a volunteer and a board member of Homes Not Borders. And we directly work with the resettlement agencies, ECDC and IRC in setting up apartments for the families before they arrive. So when they come into the, from the airport or from the hotel into their apartment, they come into a home. So we just not, not only give them the basic necessities, but we add things to make it very homey so that they will feel like they're in a warm place because they have gone through a lot to come to this point. That's lovely, Hannah. How many families have you been able to settle into their own places? Well, we work We're through the agency. Orders. Yes, we work through the resettlement agencies and they're the ones who find housing. We have actually, between August and December, we set up a 100 homes apartment. Oh, that's wonderful. And these are, you know, the numbers vary. The number of families that live in those homes vary from very large to single people to, you know, a couple and a baby. So it's, we try to leave little notes for them, um, making them feel very welcome and try to make it as culturally appropriate as possible. Tremendous, thank you. And are you a staff member or are you a volunteer with Homes Not Borders? I'm a volunteer and I'm on the board. Lovely. Thank you. And, you know, I came to this country in the six, late, early 60s when my, from India when my dad came to do his PhD. So I know, and we went to North Carolina. So I know what it feels like to be in a strange country. We knew English, that was the advantage we had, but I was the only Indian kid in the junior high school and my sister in high school. So no one knew where India was at that time. They were, I was asked all kinds of questions. So. I feel I am passing on the, what was shown to me and my family by um, a host family. And I'm glad I have the opportunity to do that. That's gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Yeah. And, you know, within Luminous Network for New Americans, too, it's just profound how many people, either immigrants or then children of immigrants who find their way wanting to help in this process and in general, as far as with, with immigrants of all the needs that exist. Um, let's go ahead and hear from other people. Is anyone else involved at this point with Afghans or how would you I, like to be? Ken Flummer from Avenus Community Services. I'll follow Hannah. Go ahead. I've collected a lot of housewares and bedding and linens and things like that. And to almost all of them have gone to um, Homes Not Borders to help them outfit. I've also given um, boxes of shelf stable food to stock the pantry to uh, Homes Not Borders. Right now, the main activity is providing um, weekly food baskets to those in long stay hotels um, for ECDC in the Bethesda area and then IRC in Montgomery County and a few over in PG County. Um, so large families, they get about 70 pounds of shelf stable and, and um, produce, uh, milk if I have it, eggs, things like that. Smaller families, um, maybe about 50 pounds a week. I know on the very large families of 10, 11, I, I'm sure that food doesn't last through the week, but um, it's what I can do. 
And then when a, a family arrives at a new, a long stay hotel and they have children, I send over a welcome backpack with a teddy bear and little things, little books, games, puzzles, school supplies, things like that to help occupy their time. And I try to um, provide feminine hygiene items. Uh, okay. As, Ken, as thank I you have so them. much. Ken, we thank you so Ken. much for what you've offered. And what I will want to say and just make totally clear um, with feminine hygiene products, that in fact, what is commonplace in the United States of tampons that absolutely is not used, just as right. a heads up for everybody who's listening. Yeah. But it sounds like you're doing so much. I was pleased that Nicholas Grossman dropped in to the chat, the Homes Not Borders website. And I wonder if at this point we might be able to hear from Anjum Malik from the Alhambra US Chamber. And if Alhambra is where I think it is, um, don't know whether you can get on and speak to us about what you're doing with constructing new resumes and refreshing existing ones to help. All right. It may be that that individual is not, not available to speak and that's okay. So the locations of the hotels really, uh, Betty, your question, Betty McGill is in fact, um, they are across Maryland. And again, through different organizations, we can help identify ways to get you involved in that. And that's gonna be, as we go back to the full session, you'll hear from Chakra as far as next steps so that you can find out too. But basically we're having organizations provide the support, um, but in communities across our state. Would anyone else like to speak about what you were doing? Or ways perhaps that you would like to get involved? It's been profound, I'll speak for just a moment, but I'll wait for any one of you to pipe up. Can I say one more thing? Please go right ahead. Okay. I have an app in uh, Telegram uh, that every time this family asks me for help, I just write a note in that app and a lot of people could see it and they go help these people. So maybe if everybody do the same thing, we could get a lot of help. Can you tell us what that app is so that we're aware of it, please? It costs Telegram. You have to set up on your cell phone. Uh, you could do it WhatsApp. Set, everybody could see it. Oh, so, okay. So it's WhatsApp. Yeah. WhatsApp. WhatsApp or Telegram is the same thing. Telegram. So, okay. Telegram, yeah. So every time family call me, they, I want food. We don't have food. I want warm clothes. I just go to app and tell people who wants to help them. I don't put their name or their telephone number, anything or address unless someone says, I want to help uh, in private mm, section. So I say, okay, you want it? You want to help? Okay. This is the address, this is the telephone number. So they go and write away. So this Jessup hotel, they don't need help anymore because all of these Iranian people are helping them. Super. So Super. they have food, they have warm clothes, they have water, shoes, whatever and they need. Do I understand mm -hmm. that you're doing this as an individual that you're not anchored with? Right. An individual, definitely individual. That's quite profound. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, um, can I this say something? Please, yes, go right ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Mona, and also I'm the interpreter. Also work for Fern. And I've been working for Fern for the past, I think like five years, uh, working as interpreter for Farsi and Dairy language. Right now also I'm working in, um, actually in Walter Reed as the interpreter there. So since we got all this Afghani since end of the August, so I'm the one who's getting actually this friend of mine, Mariam was just talking, it's just like, we all work together actually. Uh, so I'm the one like, you know, tons of people calling me and asking me for help. So I try to connect other people to see how we can help them out. Uh, one of the thing I wanna mention in here, since I know you guys are with women, is you can also ask me, I can help you guys, since I also work for friends. So they have, you know, I've been working as interpreters since God knows for the past 
12, 13 years. So if you guys need my help, you know, I'll be glad to help you guys out. And I'll get phone calls. You don't believe it. I got a phone call last night for the past. I get every night phone calls to like 11, 1130 at night. People calling me and asking me for help. So I'm willing to help any way I can. You know, I also work for IRC. Unfortunately, I should say that I know none of them doing anything. And I see like one of my questions, IRC all the time, like the caseworker, why they're helping these people. I mean, the caseworker, I'm going, you know, I know they have tons of stuff to do, but they, they have to understand these people, they just come and leave them in these houses or, you know, but and they don't give them anything. And these poor people somehow find my phone number calling me and asking me for help. Um, and I'm not just only helping them, you know, with the grocery and stuff like that. Even we have to get involved with their, you know, insurance, uh, everything else they need, you know, with the SNAP food, anything yeah. they need. But unfortunately, uh, you know, this IRC is not helping them the way they're supposed to. Well, and Mona, so I very much appreciate all that you are doing. And I know in this situation, I mean, in some ways, it's kind of like a perfect storm. And what we want to be sure is that we are finding ways to support the needs of the individuals. And I, I understand the frustration. We've heard the frustration from no, numerous people regarding the resettlement agencies. And I think the first step is, in fact, you know, basically finding ways that we can help support the resettlement agencies in doing what they do. But it, this is great. I'm so glad you spoke up. This is wonderful. You brought a great smile to my face, knowing that, in fact, I, I, I get, I mean, the firm has my number. You guys can call me anytime. And I also, I used to work with Dr. Takira for since 2005. We know each other too. So I'll be, you know, I'm so glad if I can help out any way I can just, you know, um, I'm sure you can, I mean, I can send you my information, but as I said, I'll be working for front for since like 2007. So that they have wonderful. Excellent. Uh, anybody need, you know, if you guys want to try any phone calls, you know, speak for us, your well, diary, they can Mona, always. What I would just ask is because we do not see your last name in the chat at all or whatever. What is your last name? Shal, S-H-A-L. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mana so Shal. That's great. I I'm so, glad so we've gotten some good comments in the chat that I'll bring up with a few of you. Ken Flemmer, you talked about one of the worries is about large families, seven to 10. We've even heard about families that are larger than that and how they can afford to stay in a three bedroom apartment. I'll just mention that there is a coalition in Howard, uh, sorry, Anne Arundel County called Love Anne Arundel County, L-O-V-E. That in fact is looking at how to in fact augment some expenses for families, how to help that. It's 40 religious congregations from Anne Arundel County that are exploring whether to in fact raise first month, second month as security deposit and last month rent for families to be able to help out. But the affordability question is very hard. Ken, is there anything else you wanna say on that? No, not in particular, it's just, you know, the earning power just is is going to make that an impossibility long term. Long term. And again, what we know is that those who are here on humanitarian parole for the moment, it's in fact permission to be in the country for just two years. And that's where, in fact, down the road, that legal support is important, but also the employability. Yeah. Thank you. Betty McGill mentioned that in Falston, there's been a lot of work with IRC, filling up a whole storage unit of materials. And I know so many people started doing that, of just pulling together and putting resources in. And with that, um, Betty, what I see in your note is just that there's no housing yet. And so there it sits. Do you wanna talk about it for a moment? Not really. I, I don't know what to say about it. I really don't have anything okay. more to say. I mean, it's frustrating for, yeah. for um, I can't imagine when you were talking about children being in the house, maybe it wasn't you, with was somebody on the group talking about housing with children being in a hotel for such a long time. And they're not in school. They're not being schooled. Well, and in the education section right now, the breakout session, they're talking about just that of school needs, because in fact, in the United States, we have the McKinley-Vento Act, which is a federal law 
that any child who is homeless or temporarily housed has the right and must be enrolled in public education within transportation provided too. So there's discussion from the state of Maryland, from the Maryland State Department of Education, as well as in each one of the school districts right now on ensuring that children get enrolled. But yeah, that was Chakra that mentioned that. And that's hard, really, really hard as far as again, one whole family and, and how you live in a room and stay entertained when you've got all the kids moving around and doing everything. Is there anyone else that would like to speak up? I just want to say something else, actually. Sure, uh, please, this Mona. Fact, I know after the three months, no longer anybody is helping them out with the rent. But unfortunately, most of these people, they don't even have their, you know, like they cannot even work. How these people support their family, you know, so then that they get the uh, letter from the, uh, you know, from the rent, like, you know, oh, your rent is due and you no longer kind of stay here. I don't know what can we do about these because most of these people, their three months is over and then sure. they don't have any other place to go. They don't have any work permit. They don't even have a job. They don't even speak the language. So, so how I can help these people? It's a fantastic question. And obviously there's gonna be a very large volume, but for right now, there is still pandemic funds for eviction prevention that the state of Maryland has. And specifically Luminous is doing that in Howard County where I'm based. There are actually multiple organizations that have eviction prevention money that can not only pay past rent, but future rent too. But I think- I'm oh, sorry. One of the issues we have, I know, I, I know with Howard County, Fern and Luminous is helping, but the other county, like Virginia, I have few of them that these people, they no longer have the support for the, after that three months. So, and then they call me, say, Mona, what can we do? And I had to get the help from other people so they can stay in that place for another month to see what, what else we can do. Yes, exactly, exactly. I don't, any connection in Virginia. I don't know if anyone can help me out with this, but I have few family that they're, they no longer getting support from the IRC and IRC just saying like, you know, we pay for three months, we're not helping anymore. So what are these people to do? Give you time okay. back. Yeah, I hear you. And so again, your, your concern is being registered, Mona, so that we have it. And if, if in fact, you know, as we really process through today, if there are specific links and ideas for you, we'll give it to you. That was see, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I see that Becky Brooks put a message in about the Baltimore Hebrew congregation serving as a sponsor circle, which is to sponsor a specific family um, that is supported by Hyas, which is again, a Jewish based resettlement service. And I wonder, Becky, could you take a moment to talk about your experience? I, I can. Um, I will say um, I, I'm not I'm not the person in charge. I'm sort of I'm I'm just manning the database. So um, so I don't I'm know as much as <laughs> exactly. Um, but um, I will say that one of the things we 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 were just matched uh, with a, a family just last week and um, help helping to work with Airbnb to get them into transitional housing and off the military base. Uh, and um, it looks like they're going to be in an apartment um, by the end of next week. So uh, the, the, the benefit, there, there are a lot of complicated things that uh, I haven't been privy to in terms of getting a sponsor circle started. There's a whole process. Of course, uh, folks want to make sure that it's uh, safe for the families and that the volunteers uh, uh, abide by guidelines of confidentiality, et cetera. But, um, but if you have a, a, ours is based through our synagogue, but if you have, um, if you have a group, doesn't have to be a religious organization, but it can, um, can, can go to that link and find out about forming a sponsor circle. It takes some, um, you know, a, a cadre of volunteers. We have a core team of eight, and then um, you'll need to raise a significant amount of money. So it helps if it's a, a an already established group, like a, a church or a, or a synagogue. Um, 
And, um, but the, but the benefit of it is, is that it can streamline some of the processes, especially if you have folks in your group who um, have some legal expertise, has some uh, expertise in navigating health systems, et cetera. Um, so if, if folks are, uh, have a group that they're working with and are interested in investigating that, I highly recommend um, that link sponsorcircles.org to find out more about how to do things um, uh, on the ground. Becky, thank you. Um, thank you. It's really good for people to be aware of as far as, again, the basically it's a private sponsorship initiative that the United States USCIS is a, has started um, because, in fact, the concern of our numbers compared to where we've been in the past with refugees and knowing that there are good, concerned people all around that want to be able to help out. And so it is open for organizations or religious institutions, or as I understand um, sponsorship circles too, it could be just a good collective of a neighborhood group that wanted to start it. So thank you. I understand that in a couple minutes, we are going to uh, be moving back to in Real fact the quick, full group. Jill. Yes, please. I know the private sponsorship is, is an important piece here. But in Montgomery County alone, there's like a hundred families in hotels. And that's going to stay at that level, you know, into March, April, perhaps before, you know, the volume is going to just collapse us. And that's not counting what's going on in Baltimore. Exactly. Which really speaks to the, what I think is the value of just starting this discussion now across our state of organizations and individuals that are stepping up and can step up. But yes, it's a very, very big concern. You maybe heard Mike speak earlier about the Afghan Welcome Center that we've set up at one of the hotels near BWI. And with that too, it's a short-term use of in fact a conference meeting room of a hotel that can be used as a center for English as a second language and intake needs and other pieces, the public library coming in, other things. But clearly it's that question of how long people will be staying in the hotels. And so there's real concern. And as you know, Washington Post this last week did, did attention on this. And I think there will be other media concerns too, because it's just- One of the things challenged. that I've that I've been hearing, well, they're not going to be resettled in Montgomery County. They're all going to end up in PG County. And so there's, it's kind of a mental barrier there for yes. some group. Exactly. Exactly. So with that, what I will note is that people are re-entering this main room right now. We're going to give them just a few minutes. For those of you that have been with me for this discussion, thank you. Because clearly to have various people speaking up about their experiences, their insights, their overwhelm, their concern, very, very important. It's that chance to really share. And I will note too, that in this room, there's been someone taking notes so that we've got that notes afterwards too, which is so very important. So as you see, the numbers are going up as far as our participants and we'll get going again in just a minute. Well, it looks like it looks like amazing. We, we don't want to come back. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Thank you so Rich much again. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful, and the many groups pair, like you know, area. That's that's amazing. Thank you, Jill and Mike for and everyone for organizing this. This is amazing. Our deep pleasure in making a difference and making it easier for, in fact, our new Afghan members and neighbors. It takes time. So with that, um, if in fact, there I am. Hello everyone, welcome back. Glad you're here. I hope your discussions within your small groups were productive. I see that was amazing. Thank you, Sarah Abdel. We are glad to in fact have fostered at least a beginning of exchange of resources and experiences. Because clearly, you know, it's that concept of how do we make healthy communities? We take it by, in fact, everyone working together and understanding that this goodwill is a very important first start in making that happen. So 
but I'd like to hear back a little bit from, in fact, our facilitators of some of those sessions. And actually what I'd like to do is just kind of start popping up and so be ready, I'll ask you to do something. I know that in those sessions too, there were note takers. Let me just say again, note takers, yes, please. I would love for you to send us the notes so that we have that comprehensive understanding what happened in the sessions. So I wonder as we begin, um, is there a, one of the facilitators from health that would like to speak about your discussion? I think that's me. Um, so I'm Osaya Sham, I'm a ENT physician here in uh, Montgomery County. And we had um, a nice cozy discussion about uh, 15 or 16 folks in our group. Um, mainly healthcare providers, but we also had folks uh, who work with uh, government organizations such as USCID, nonprofits, uh, uh, lawyers. Um, so uh, we had a nice uh, mix of uh, different groups of people. Um, most of the people on the, on the group, um, we also had folks from faith-based uh, uh, groups, uh, churches, et cetera, who are currently sponsoring uh, families or helping families settle in. Um, because of our small group, we were able to introduce each other and have a kind of an idea about each other's backgrounds. And most folks are actually actively involved in doing something with refugees already. Um, and we uh, quickly turned a uh, topic of conversation into areas of need where we think um, things that, that need to be urgently addressed and how we can hopefully come together and continue the conversation um, uh, so that's basically, um, you know, the, the, the main um, aspect of our, um, our group and uh, let everybody else have a turn and, and see if they're, yeah. Thank you. What we're going to do really is a kind of a popcorn style of just hearing from a few people knowing that in fact, we had 16 groups operating. And so I hope that there were rich conversations all across. I'd like to hear next from, in fact, the discussion group that had to do with um, government services. Would one of those facilitators please speak up? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, share a little bit. So our group, we had uh, a similar uh, mix of, of some individuals who are deeply working and at the hotels every day or every other day um, to some individuals who have are, are from a church group and, and looking to have people and volunteers ready to go and, and want to get connected. Um, a huge concern, which is something that we've heard many, many times, um, is that there are a lot of individuals without um, their Medicaid cards and who are not receiving their SNAP benefits. Um, and then an, another piece we talked about is um, the, the issue of driver's licenses. And so specifically around that, we, we talked about what resources exist and other groups that are already supporting that. And if we can come up with resources that can be shared so that we're not duplicating any efforts. And, and once we have a system and, and individuals that can provide support, um, that that can be passed along. Uh, a huge issue, of course, with all these things also is, is interpreters. And so finding individuals who um, speak Dari and Pashtu, and we had someone in our group who was very kind and, um, and offered to support with some translation and interpretation. Superb. Thank you so much. I wonder if we can hear from education, one of the facilitators, and then from career skills and employment. Sure. Hey, Jill. Hello, folks. So the education group um, had a really robust conversation on what are the challenges that we're seeing going forward and trying to get the children who are currently either at K through 12 or the pre-K level um, to get access to education. Some of the concerns were brought up was making sure that any correct forms that they might need or not need um, are being filled out by school districts and also making sure that our partners are also aware that with certain federal law and regulations that students who are not with the permanent residence are able to actually in fact attend the schools that they're currently residing in district wise. We also came up across a situation of making sure that students would be able to get the transportation needed from where they're living to the actual schools that are being in person as well. Um, and finally, we tried to make sure that we could pool resources because we had a really energetic group between those who have experience working either in school districts or with refugees or those who just really want to help out. And how do we even find even tutors to help students 
gain the language skills they need to transition to make sure that they're not part of the lost generation um, of education here in Maryland. Thank you very much, Sarmat Chaudhry. And he's a new staff member with the United Nations Association. So we're very glad that you're involved here with us. Okay, career skills and employment. I wonder if there is perhaps Poliana Conti who could speak. Yes, or I can share. Would... Yes, thank, thank you, Jill. I can share the, the experience with my team. So a lot of people engaged already uh, with, the, with yeah, the, the, the group and the, the mission. So one of the things that were very interesting questions were how okay, sustainability, case sustainability questions, right? How can we put together some resources and especially to help them find the search, right? So to understand how to do a soft job search in the US. Um, and also um, how if you have, right, the resource links, as an example that someone gave us as a resource link, can we have a list of, okay, if you are a physician, how do you do? What do you need to do? What are the steps that you can you can go through to be validating your diploma in the US, right? So there are several uh, steps that the person needs to go. And same for an attorney or every different professions. Um, so those are things that we can think about. How can we identify resources to support and, and uh, those groups? But very engaged group. Um, and I'm, I thank Shandana to, to take notes for us and hopefully we get a lot of sharing also on the chat. Wonderful, and, and that's it. I mean, even those that stayed in this room, it was a very rich discussion and incredible resources across the 212 people who are on this Zoom right now. So let's do one last report out and that would be legal services. I wonder if one of those individuals might be able to speak up who yes. led the facilitating. Tom Bradley, Certainly go ahead. Can. I'm Tom Bradley. We had uh, exactly seven people in our breakout. So uh, we had a really good discussion. In addition to Sarah Craven, we had uh, a high school student uh, in, from Maryland, uh, Benita Besa, who is gonna report out uh, in writing. And uh, she has been involved with the Afghan Alliance in Maryland and has really put a lot of uh, time and energy into this effort already. We had a good discussion. We had recovering lawyers, we had active lawyers, and we had lay people, uh, not lawyers, who uh, engaged in the conversation. We learned that, and, and this anecdotally seems true from my experience, that even if it appears that a regulation is written in plain language, you still should get advice from a lawyer uh, concerning these things. There are many tricks and turns that we just don't know unless you're deeply involved in the immigration system. There are throughout the Washington area, many immigration lawyers, uh, the, the place is packed with immigration lawyers and many of them very kindly and generously so uh, provide time and services pro bono, uh, hours and hours of pro bono services to go file papers at courthouses or give advice on, uh, on intricate issues that, uh, that are involved. And they've been very generous uh, in our experience. Okay. There are organizations throughout Maryland that it, are involved in immigration reception and immigration services. Thank you. Excellent. So this is just a bare, bare minimum sampling of, in fact, the rich discussions that took place. What I'd like to do is shift our gears right now to Shakra Rahimi, who is, in fact, the Afghan coordinator for Maryland um, of the Afghan Alliance to really talk about what are the next steps, Chakra, that are gonna be happening because there's been so much engagement and so much of sharing of resources in, in fact, this Afghan summit. Chakra. Uh, thank you, Jill. So um, the next step would be uh, onboarding process, which starts from uh, the online, app, online application, uh, sign up for orientation and um, also a uh, confidentiality agreement and background check. And uh, in the next two days, uh, they will look for an email from me um, regarding the resources on confidentiality agreement, um, the um, background check uh, for onboarding process, uh, sign up for orientation, and uh, also subscribing to a biweekly newsletter. Thank you very much, Shakra. So we've got a process. From here, you will be hearing from us in a couple days. 
And in fact, if you would like to get involved to share resources further, you are most welcome to. I'm gonna pass this then to do the closing to Mike Mitchell, who is the CEO of Luminous. But before I do, I wanna say that it has been superb to be able to share this experience with you as your moderator and to really see the confluence of the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area and Luminous with the Afghan Alliance of Maryland. In fact, in that stepping up of goodwill as we all are wanting to do the very best for our Afghan neighbors. Mike, the closing words are yours. Thanks, Jill. Um, first of all, I really want to thank Jill for what she did to pull this all together. Um, she deserves kudos if there's an applause button. Um, it is just uh, kudos to Jill and kudos to all of the staff who have put this together. Um, I also would like to thank uh, different funders that had funded us. Uh, many of you made a donation uh, during the planning of this. We are grateful uh, to the Rice Foundation, the Community Foundation of Howard County, to Anne Arundel County government, to uh, different foundations such as the Jane Foundation. There are some large individual donors that have made uh, gifts to us. We are so grateful, so grateful to all of you. The other thing that I would say is that this is the beginning. It is truly just the beginning. So as the beginning, we are going to need your help. Um, we have started doing what we can to broker connections. And again, we do not see ourselves as the center of all this, but really just trying to be a connector of networks. And we think we can do that. And if you all sign up every Thursday, for example, we're going to be adding names of organizations and networks to the intake form. And we're going to be connecting those networks to Afghans that need help. That will happen because of all of you. The other thing that I want to thank, uh, say is thank all those people that have been involved so far. Um, and uh, that includes many of the organizations. And I know that I will miss some, but um, uh, the uh, ERICA, which is the Episcopal Refugee and Immigrant Group, um, IOSC in Baltimore, um, uh, there's an, an I, I, you know what, I can't remember, um, I know I'll miss folks, but there are so many of you that have been involved, so please, uh, please accept my thanks. The people that have also signed up for the Afghan Alliance um, board, the advisory board, we are grateful uh, to all of you. You will help guide this ship. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the best way to make a difference is to think differently. Um, if you think about Luminous, um, and when you look at our name, it is not accidental that, for example, the U in Luminous is about you, and the U.S. is not about U.S. the country, it is about us. And if you look at the arc in our logo, it is very intentional that it is from you to us. Luminous is corely focused on providing services directly to immigrants and refugees here in Central Maryland, but we are also dedicated to changing the narrative about immigrants and refugees in the United States. That does not come from us doing all the work. It comes from you. It comes from the experiences that you have working with Afghans and working with other immigrants. And it comes from the different board members and volunteers that get involved with this organization. So um, on behalf of the organization, the board members, everyone who's been involved, I just wanna express my thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Know that you're gonna be hearing more from us and just know that we are deeply grateful. Please uh, keep in touch with us. I will also, I believe all of you have my email address, but I will put it in the chat. Um, and uh, with that, I think we are we are done. And we, we, we gave you back 16, no, 18 minutes. You didn't know that you were gonna have um, and got a lot done because of you. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, take care. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.